So welcome everybody, and thank you for joining the Garrison Institute's Pathway to Planetary Health uh, Forum. I'm Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of the Garrison Institute. Before we begin today's session, let's review a few logistical items for our gathering. This is a Zoom webinar, so your audio uh, and video will be off for the duration of the webinar. There is a Q&A box, though, at the bottom of your screen, and please direct any questions to that. And I'll be reading those and try and integrate them in part of the conversation, and we'll really focus on, on them in the end of the conversation. We're recording these sessions, and you'll have a chance to review these recording, recordings, as well as schedule of upcoming programs at garrisoninstitute.org. And you can also, if you love this conversation, you can share a link to the recording with your two others. This interactive online event is part of our Pathways to Planetary Health Forum 2022 series. And the Planet Pathways to Planetary Health explores regeneration across four pathways, half Earth, which is protecting the Earth's biodiversity, ecological civilization, so how do we live in alignment with nature's principles, regenerative economics, how do we design an economic system that supports regeneration of humans and nature, and the common good, what is really the underlying holism, the wholeness from which all of life comes. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, Dr. Nicole Redfords. Dr. Redfords is a member of the Dewey Kui, I'm sure I mispronounced it, First Nation of the Dineda um, uh, peoples in Northwest Canada, and has been working with indigenous patients, scholars, and communities from around the globe for her entire career. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the Department of Indigenous Health at the University of North Dakota, where she helped develop and launch the first Indigenous Health PhD program. Dr. Redvers is also the co-founder and current board chair of the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation, which is a Canadian charity based in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, which provides traditional indigenous rooted land-based wellness support for Northerners. She's also been actively involved in regional, national, and international levels, promoting the inclusion of indigenous practices in both human and planetary health research and practice. And she's the author of a trade paperback book titled The Science of the Sacred Bridging Global Indigenous Medicine Systems and Modern Scientific Principles, which I'm going to unblur my background and show you right now. It's a fantastic book really full of all kinds of interesting information. Um, I encourage you to get it. And so welcome, Nicole. Merci, Joe. Um, thank you. Uh, one more thing. If you in the audience scan the chat, uh, we uh, the amazing Garrison Institute staff will um, post things. So for example, there is a link to the book. There's a link to the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation, et cetera. So um, as the conversation goes around, along, if there is an interesting idea that we refer to, most likely there'll be a link for it. All right. So um, Nicole, where were you born and where'd you grow up? Hmm. Uh, a place that not many people are aware of, uh, even within uh, the Canadian landscape where I'm originally from. Um, I was uh, raised uh, in, in, a, in a very small, little, tiny, tiny uh, community, Deninuque or Fort Resolution. It was known during the, the fur trade era on the southeastern portion of Great Slave Lake, which is one of the 25 largest lakes uh, in the world, located within uh, Denaday or the Northwest Territories, uh, Canada. Uh, we did not have healthcare systems, uh, um, so I was uh, trucked away to, to, my mom was trucked away to give birth to me in, a, in another center, uh, which is unfortunately the common occurrence even today within Indigenous communities who don't have access to certain services. But um, I'm definitely a, a Northerner, uh, born and raised, and uh, still miss that fresh, crisp, cold air whenever I'm away. Mm. And there was both in the United States and Canada through much of the 20th century and even before, a real effort to wipe out indigenous culture. And so um, I presume your parents and your grandparents, there was a, uh, were, uh, were sent to um, 
boarding schools and schools that didn't teach indigenous practices and I and your early education was in more of a Western education. Yeah, we're we're coming up actually on September 30th to what's called uh, Orange Shirt Day. It's a, a, a day that was uh, really prominent and has been in the last few years in Canada, but increasing now in the United States, which is a day of recognition of, we call it residential schools in Canada. It's referred to as boarding schools, as you noted, in the United States, where uh, children were forcibly removed from their families for the purposes of killing the Indian and saving the child. Uh, my mother was a residential school survivor. My grandmother was a resident residential school survivor and many of my family members. So that history is, is very much acute in the experiences of indigenous peoples here today and was not just a, a historical occurrence, unfortunately. Right, and this is also happening in New Zealand and Australia and all Absolutely. over the world. And so this precious, amazing knowledge, which we so much need in this time, if you think about it, there were just these bare threads that were that remained, and yet it did remain. Um, so I'd love to you tell us a little bit of the story of how did this knowledge persist amongst this oppressive system to destroy it, and then talk about its flourishing and how it's coming back. Mm. Yeah, it's an it's an unbelievable history, you know, in so many different geopolitical landscapes around the the globe, and in many cases, it wasn't only you know the residential and boarding boarding school systems, but even the practor, practice of culture, the practice of indigenous knowledge and ceremony was outlawed. It was illegal. It was a legal practice. People could be arrested uh, for practicing their their cultural ways, and this was uh, both in in Canada, the United States, and and also, you know, I'm sure in other other contexts as well. And because of that, a lot of the knowledge went underground, so to speak. That was really the word that was used. But I've even heard elders tell stories where they, they did not share knowledge uh, to their kids because they were concerned that it was going to put their kids at risk um, uh, out there in the world. So they, they chose to withhold their knowledge for that reason. So there really was these intergenerational breaks in knowledge transmission because of these colonial processes uh, that had occurred. And really a, a large amount of effort, relearning, revitalization efforts now happening uh, across the indigenous world, trying to reconnect the pieces that were broken um, and, and are just so thankful to some of the knowledge holders that, that kept this information and kept the underground uh, transmissions going of knowledge uh, throughout the, the uh, 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 illegal um, uh, policies that were in place, but also, you know, ongoing discrimination against Indigenous people broadly. But as you noted, we're seeing a resurgence now of interest, um, uh, both locally, nationally, and internationally uh, in and around Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous peoples, which is really um, amazing to see, but it's also very delicate as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's delicate in the sense of we have a peoples that are just trying to regain their connections um, in themselves and in their communities and their families, let alone, um, you know, having this additional layer of, of, of essentially outsider interest to knowledge when we're just trying to sort it out at the community level, so to speak, within a modern world. So, so it, it is delicate in some instances. So I want to talk about the relationship between deep wisdom and knowledge, physical place and language. And I'm going to give an example. So what was interesting is, you know, around 800 BC in uh, Babylonia, there were, in the Middle East, there was something called the Babylonian captivity in which the Jews were taken out of their land and taken to Babylonia. And it was there that they put together the texts and the stories of their myths and their, what they, their history, and they created the beginnings of the Old Testament. Well, so what was interesting about it was that was done when they were disconnected from their place. And what they said is, we are the people of the book, and as long as we have the book, no matter where we are, this knowledge will hold. And that became, in a way, a an element, a stream of the Judeo-Christian traditions that unfolded ever since. The indigenous worldview much more deeply connects wisdom and place. And so it's interesting to me because in many ways, the indigenous sacred lands have been taken away or people have been removed from them. Also, 
we know that every language sees it, reflects a worldview. And uh, the indigenous, you know, the, we've lost many of the indigenous language speakers. So I'd love to hear about the regeneration of this indigenous wisdom. And to what extent is it happening with and without the language in the place? Mm. Yeah, it, it's such a complex issue. And we often hear uh, not much about indigenous languages in the context of planetary health and, and, and overall well being, but it's absolutely and fundamentally cr critical. Um, and the reason for that is our indigenous languages are the map of knowledge, um, but mm. those languages are fundamentally rooted within the lands that we come from. And not many people are aware that indigenous languages are verb based, they're not noun based. So the very name of an animal, the very name of a plant, the very name of the river tells a story about that. So basically, you're educated uh, uh, on knowing the terminology because the name is a process, the name is a story in and of itself. And, you know, if you're not in a land base where you get to learn the name of that plant, where you get to see it, where you get to touch it, where you get to engage with it, smell it, perhaps taste it, all of these teachings that we have, it's very difficult to be able to understand how that process name actually is embodied within the nature of that plant because you've never seen it before or you've never smelt it before. Um, and that really is the, the key missing piece that we've seen in, in much of the conservation talk and, and the planetary wellness talk is, is how important our language our languages are. Um, we've seen a resurgence, absolutely. It's the decade of indigenous languages right now. The United Nations has called for that due to the recognition of the importance of indigenous languages. We are losing one indigenous language uh, every week or two. It's it's unbelievable the, the rate of loss and a lot of angst over what that means for the collective knowledge and wisdom um, of these lands and of the planet and for all of us, frankly. Um, and I would love to see more attention being given to the importance of language uh, revitalization within planetary health and climate and biodiversity loss spaces because of that fundamental connection uh, that we have. Our language is the root, and, and elders will often repeat that and repeat that. We are a people because of our language, because the language is the story of the land. You can't separate them out uh, at all. They're fundamentally interconnected. Mm. Um, could you give me so? I want to delve deeper into this idea about verbs versus nouns, because the Western culture is a very noun focused culture. Mm -hmm. So could you give an example of, um, of a, a, ver a verb that tells a story, you know, and what we would call a name that tells a story? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, my, my community, my region, uh, we are Dene. So we're Dene peoples, D-E-N-E, -E, Dene peoples. And De means land and Ne means flow. So because of that, Dene, we flow from the land and the land flows from us. So basically, we're, we are an extension of the land as people. There's a teaching behind us as a people. It's not just that we're Dene, we're actually a part of the land in them. So, you know, we don't often think through those aspects, but that would be, you know, one example of how the process, the flowing from the land is embodied within our name. It's, we are not just a people's, we are a flow, a process from land and interconnected with it. Mm. This interconnection of place and space and time and history, and I presume your sense of history goes all the way back to the beginning. Mm. And then it goes all the way forward to the future. And within that, also there's an, an implied or maybe in a different word, a sense of responsibility for it all too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we shrink things to nouns, we eliminate all that and we just turn them into objects. And then objects, can be owned in our worldview or sold or whatever, but they're or used. The objects are there to be used, whereas in a verb, it's a process that you can join. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different relay. So I'd love you to talk more about the relationship with creation that then comes from this more verb view. Mm -hmm. 
you're, you know, you, you, we kind of refer to earth and, and nature as an it in, in some senses. And, yeah. and Robin Wall Kimmerer has done some beautiful work, of course, describing the importance of not referring Mother Earth as an it, but but as an entity of process, as you've noted. And you know, the, the beauty of, of, of indigenous languages through that process is it, is it really is all about narrative story history embodied within one word. The, the depth and the thought that has, it's just beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. Each word is almost like a poem in and of itself mm -hmm. that you can sit with. You can sit with that word and you can think about it in many different ways, shapes, or forms. And in our region, we talk about different levels of language. So, you know, the conversation language where we just, you know, we're having a conversation here today. Um, you know, perhaps maybe a child's language where you're just a new learner, you're starting to embody these, these new words. So child learner, you know, communicative learner. And then we have what we call up north a trapper's level of, of knowledge, uh, trappers and hunters level, you know, gather knowledge where you're able to go out and, and forage and you have that innate knowledge of the landscape of the process there. But then we have what's called elders knowledge, which is that very, very deep spiritual connective uh, knowledge that puts all of those other three processes together within the inner relationship within the world. So as you learn language, you graduate through these levels. But in the Western language, we often stop at the communication level. <laughs> we stop there and we don't right. go to other levels up, which again is that that relationship to the earth, but then the elder kind of level of knowledge, which is that interconnected piece. So I like to think about it like that for Western learners sometimes, because it may, may, makes it easier to think when we're sort of structuring things. Although, of course, you know, I don't mean to embody any hierarchy in that process of description, because there really is not, there's not a level, but, but it really does speak to that uh, you know, how language can, can really impart a deeper meaning within the world and how we experience it. And then you talked about really thinking about a word. So let's talk about the contemplative traditions. So it sounds like you would actually meditate or, or really reflect deeply on a word or an idea. So talk about that, the contemplative side of in, in, your, your, the Dene indigenous practice. Mm -hmm. I think one of the you know, the most common things that root us, at least within our Northern landscapes, because we have Dene peoples, we have Métis peoples, we also have Inuit peoples uh, mm. within, the, you know, the Arctic borders. So we're, we're very much diversified even within the circumpolar areas uh, of the world. And, you know, our teachings are often surrounded by sources of heat because we're in a very cold area. So fires are very important for us, whether or not it's for ceremonies, whether or not it's for warmth, whether or not it's a kulik, which is the, the heating device within, you know, an Inuit traditional home. All of these aspects of surrounding ourselves around the fire and discussion and thought in ceremony is very much, um, you know, connected. And because of that, that fire is very emblematic and, and symbolic about reflection and sitting amongst the each other, not necessarily only in conversation, but to create an evolution of the thought process of that community, whether or not it's to figure out where we need to go next in terms of finding our caribou or going to find, uh, you know, certain plants or connecting with other community members. But there's that time just to sit and, and be with land and to watch and to see and to learn from all of the things around us. And, and I remember a teaching from the elder in, a De, in the Decho region, which is a certain group, because there's many different groups of Dene peoples, who said very clearly that we never lose our knowledge. We'll, we'll never lose mm -hmm. our knowledge because if you just go back to the land, your knowledge will come back. Mm -hmm. And the reflection really is, is that it is the land. It's it's being in that contemplative place of listening, of accepting, of being that really brings about the knowledge that we have evolved with for thousands of years, watching the food that the beaver eats, watching the medicine that the beaver eats, watching the patterns of migration, the way that the animals swim in the water, all of these have lessons to teach us because they are also knowledge holders uh, around us. And we're just one part of that greater system. Um, so, you know, I've had this conversation sometimes where the contemplative traditions are sort of embodied where you you, you kind of have this time, but in, in 
as as how I understand it in our community is the contemplative tradition is our life. It's embodied mm. within it every day. It can't be separated from it because it's just part of who you are. Um, if you're if you're living in a good way with the land. Yes. So now let's talk about uh, what you've been doing in terms of indigenous health. So. Um, there is a Western medicine system. It, it's very good for some things. It's actually failing in many other things. Um, so I'd love to talk about, hear about your journey back into indigenous health to learning about it and how you inter integrate that with Western health. Mm. Well, one of the things that is um, the, the history of our peoples, at least within my region, but also in, in North America and, and, and even in places like Otaturota, New Zealand and, and Australia, where the colonizers never really left, <laughs> is that the, the experience of medicine for my family, for the first time, the experience of Western medicine was in residential or boarding school. That was the first experience of Western medical care. You can imagine because of the trauma that was embodied within those schools generally, that the perception of medicine as something that helps and heals um, is very much disconnected from the reality of the indigenous experience. So that experience has then been passed down through generations and conversations, the energy, how uh, Western medicine has been portrayed, which really has been a lack of trustworthiness um, on, on behalf of medicine towards communities and a lack of acknowledgement of those harms that have created. So I recognized that when I was very young. I saw it in my family refusing to go for care. I saw it in relatives who would wait until they were uh, unfortunately very sick before going to seek care in emergent conditions. And by then it was very difficult to deal with the situation. Um, and that really led me to think that something's not going right here. Our people are not being helped by these systems. We need to figure out a way where our systems are the root, our systems are the solutions. And then we figure out how Western healthcare can support our systems instead of the other way around. Mm. Because we often think about, you know, how can we be inclusive of Indigenous peoples in Western systems? Or how can we be inclusive of uh, healing traditions that are not Western? But maybe it's actually the other way around that we need to be thinking. We have our system and let's figure out how Western systems can support that in the ways that, that we feel is necessary for our so self-determination, but also our overall wellness as communities. So can you give some examples? So, so first of all, so you had this idea and there really wasn't much there. You, you created this movement. You, you brought the the wisdom of the elders and the wisdom of the Western systems together. So how did you do that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, I was just a small little ant in this process. And, you know, my elders always remind me that we're, we're no more important than those ants on the ground. And, you know, our job and role is to support the community. And, and the elders in my region have been doing advocacy work for, for decades, but facing a lot of barriers and, and discrimination, structural inequities as part of that process. And, you know, my role was uh, really to, to take on and extend that work and try to figure out ways to merge our realities with the Western systems that uh, had been putting up these barriers for, for so long. So what we decided to do was gather elders from all around uh, the northern subarctic and Arctic regions together um, and have a conversation about what needed to be done. Um, and many of them had, had very much supported the need for our own traditional healing and wellness services for our people to be centered, um, for us to be the voice of those conversations. And because of that, uh, it wasn't easy. We had a lot of pushback. We had a lot of difficulty trying to find funding. We had uh, to, to face all sorts of Western bylaws and policies that got in our way. But eventually, uh, in 2018, we were able to set up one of the first in North America urban land-based healing camps for Indigenous peoples, mm. which was a land camp situated in an urban center, because, of course, many of our Indigenous relatives now uh, reside in urban centers. Unfortunately, many of them are unhoused. Uh, many of them have a lot of trauma and difficulties uh, navigating uh, society. So this land camp 
provided traditional counseling, traditional healing, uh, traditional food when we were able to. We didn't have scores of paperwork. People can come and go as they needed. And, and just be able to be, to be able to be in a space that you can walk into a, a canvas tent that smells like your grandmother's cabin um, from when you were small, that smells like moose hide, that smells like dry fish. It has the embodiment of the experience of being on the land for our people. Um, and we've been in operation now for almost five years uh, since that time and have seen some amazing impacts uh, of our people going through that kind of support system, not at the exclusion of Western ways per se, but centering our ways first and foremost, and then being able to, to offer support for those to navigate those outside systems as they need as they need it. Right. So, for example, you write in your book about uh how we completely over medicalize uh, people with antibiotics, um, and and uh, it's a it's not only a human issue. We're now deeply affecting our, all of life on Earth with our over antibioticness. But at the same time, there are some times when which somebody really needs an antibiotic, and so you have now people who can who understand both modalities and can come up with the mixture that's right for the, the people there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, I presume, so I, I see that, you know, the elders are dying. And um, I'm sure there's a lot more wisdom to gain from, you know, the, the time is running short and there's a lot to gain. So what is the method that you're using to, to gain that wisdom? And that wisdom is not like a fact, like wisdom, like, the A means B. It's a situational wisdom that, so it 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 takes real heart. It's not just documenting it. So mm. how are you gain? How are you gaining the wisdom? Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it's an interesting question because uh, the traditional protocols that exist within each indigenous community are incredibly different for how knowledge transmission occurs. And, you know, you can't just decide one day I'm going to try to get Indigenous wisdom. Um, even as an Indigenous person, you know, right. I, I'm just going to decide today that I'm going to get some teachings. You know, it doesn't work like that. There's a there's a reciprocity in body, but there's also a sacrifice that's involved in our region. Um, certain protocols need to be done to, for you even to be able to start accessing certain levels of knowledge. In some communities, it may mean going on ceremonial fast. It may be participating in sun dances. It may be participating in other things where you're giving yourself to the community you're giving yourself to Mother Earth um, in a process of symbolism and ceremony. And by that very nature, the reciprocity embodied is starting to gain knowledge. Um, and we have, you know, a unique sweat lodge is another one, of course, there, there's many different types of things that are there. But what's critical in that piece to understand is that the wisdom is is not necessarily you know some sort of thing that floats around mm. us and and we just saturates us um what, how i've always been taught at least is that the land itself is an active participant in the healing and the knowledge process but but we often just don't allow things to percolate in that way so when you look at land as an active participant as a host as an educator um, as a wisdom giver in that way simply by being on land um in in that mindset automatically starts to embody thoughts and processes because you be begin to remember who you are. I think we all have knowledge with inside of us. We've just disconnected it. We're just disconnected from it. Um, and by situating ourselves within these processes, oftentimes those teachings start to just come. Um, and, and it mm. goes back to that elder's knowledge. We never lose the knowledge. You just have to go back out on the land. Um, and that's how the knowledge will come back to you. So yes, the elders, unfortunately, you know, we're losing many of them. We lost an elder in Tlutzoke, which is a small little Dennis community a couple of weeks ago in my home region, who is a very respected elder. And, and these elders, it's, it's a painful process when they decide to go back home for those that are still here because of the amount of knowledge that they hold. But 
my my number one thing for ensuring that this is the case is we need to do more to support indigenous youth because by supporting indigenous youth in communities we're automatically enabling uh, uh, um, an environment that is conducive to intergenerational transmission um, and sometimes we're jumping to to elders and expecting them to share but really those elders want to share with their own youth and if we're not allowing that transmission to happen within indigenous communities themselves it's almost impossible to have that knowledge embodied elsewhere in the world and outside of community. So the self-determination, the support in community is needed first. Allow that intergenerational uh, transmission to happen to Indigenous peoples first and foremost. Do the disruptions that we've had. And the more that we can do as allies to support that, the more likely we're going to be able to uh, benefit from 80% of the world's biodiversity being stewarded by indigenous peoples because that knowledge is being transmitted. A third of the world's old growth forests will continue to be stewarded because indigenous peoples are well and that intergenerational transfer is occurring. That is our best hope um, in terms of uh, uh, us as a world, in, in my opinion. Great, would you go back and just explain to our audience more that that eighty percent of the world's biodiversity is being stewarded by indigenous peoples? So talk unpack that. Yeah, so right now in the globe, indigenous peoples make up about six percent of the population around there, six percent of the population. Yet uh, eighty percent of the world's remaining biodiversity on the planet right now is managed and stewarded by indigenous people. So 6% of the world's population are stewarding 80% of the bio, world's biodiversity, remaining biodiversity. Maybe we're doing something right. Right. And maybe you're also not doing something wrong. Yes. What we've been doing. So <laughs> Absolutely. This, so this is really, really important. And one of the things is as the Western economic system intrudes into indigenous lands, it undermines indigenous in effect indigenous economies and ways of life it makes it harder for indigenous people to actually be those stewards mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely i've had the privilege of working with the batwa indigenous peoples in southwestern uganda and uh, for those that are familiar within the Western world with the gorillas um, that are in the, the, the Batwa forest uh, bordering Uganda, um, Congo, as well as Rwanda. And in the 90s, the government forcibly evicted Batwa peoples from the forest uh, for the conservation efforts of the gorilla. Um, and they have not been allowed back on their land, have received no reparations since then. And in fact, it's illegal for them to go and harvest and pick their traditional medicines and uh, um, uh, hunt their traditional animals within that range. Still today, um, they can be arrested for going into the forest. Uh, now that was in the 1990s. We're, you know, 2022 today. So we're talking, you know, over 30 years of, of knowledge now removed from the forest um, and the conservation of that forest, what it means. Um, and even though Batwa people never consumed gorillas or monkeys, that's not part of their traditional diet there. So these are the types of histories uh, that we have where forest removal, uh, the Maasai people was a great case this year where the Tanzanian government forcibly removed at gunpoint Maasai peoples from their lands due to the creation of a conservation area um, with a country um, partnered in the Middle East. Um, and mm. these mistakes are still happening. And we have conservation groups that are still supporting governments that are enacting these policies that will cut off the intergenerational, intergenerational transmission of, of traditional ecological knowledge within these areas that will affect generations, but ultimately will also affect us. Um, those are the types of things that we need more awareness on because of that critical uh, um, need uh, that you had noted about the importance of indigenous stewardship for our forests, rainforests, boreal forests, deserts, oceanways, everywhere. Mm -hmm. There are counterexamples, fortunately. So, for example, in Kenya, there's something called the Maasai Conservation Trust, yep. which is a model in which uh, the Maasai actually own their lands and now are beginning to get sell carbon credits and and actually, and then take that money and use it to support their health and education systems, et cetera. So where instead of saying that the indigenous people are 
a risk to the land is so interesting because it is the Western worldview that's the risk to the land. And then we're going and saying, okay, people who screwed this all up, we're going to eliminate the people who there were the protectors. Um, so uh, you mentioned how important it is for the elders and youth to, to rebuild the cycle of knowledge within indigenous communities. But this is also knowledge to be really valuable for Western for the rest of us and to have radiate out or trans translated. So where, where do you see good examples of that transmission or that, that expansion of that knowledge and maybe where it's had an effect? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a really important question. And I've had recent conversations in the last literally weeks uh, uh, on this with other indigenous colleagues, uh, uh, knowledge holders around the world. We're, we're at a time in society where we're clearly in crisis. In fact, we have multiple crises going on. And the importance of knowledge has never been so great um, in many communities' minds. And many Indigenous nations know this. They know the changes that are happening on their land. But they also have to reconcile with very strong and, and um, important traditional protocols that exist within their communities. And we were faced with this question now of, of how do we balance those two opposing kind of things. One are protocols which don't us allow, don't in some cases allow us to share certain types of information um, because of the ceremonial process that's involved. And then on the other hand, this clear state of crises that will impact you know, the very survivability of communities generally. How do we reconcile those two things? And this is a fundamental issue that we're seeing in many communities. As noted, some are very willing to share, but others follow very different protocols that, that have restrictions on how knowledge is, is done. But then also the histories of, of extraction that have occurred where knowledge has been pulled from Indigenous communities used outside of context without the benefit of Indigenous peoples. And then it brews that increasing environment of mistrust. So, you know, there, there's a lot of complexity around that question when we think through, you know, the possibilities mm -hmm. of that. Having said that, um, you know, the, the worldview perspectives, the, the meta level perspectives of interconnections, interconnection with nature are particularly powerful. And I think those teachings are very much ripe and, and elders have been very much open to, to um, um, passing on that knowledge to all community members on the importance of connecting and how to connect with nature in certain ways. Um, and that's one area I haven't seen any restriction uh, for the most part on mm. um, when it comes to knowledge sharing and transmission. You know, it's interesting because there are knowledge systems in the Himalayan Buddhist communities. There are knowledge systems and there are knowledge systems um, all over the world that uh, have restricted elements. And what you're saying, though, is that there are a, a worldview that there may be practices that are restricted and ceremonies that are restricted, but there's a worldview that should be freely disseminated. OK, so we have all these different worldviews, but they're all really about this verb versus noun. They're about deep interconnection. They're about all the wisdom is in the land. They're about deep relationality with nature herself. Um, are you seeing a movement where across different cultures and traditions, they're beginning to come together? Yeah, there, there seems to be some evidence of that. And I think the, the greatest example is um, a story that was told to me by some of uh, my elders who participated in the, uh, the uh, Congress of the World Religions. I, I'm not sure if I'm getting the title right, mm. but group of religions from around the world coming together and, and having conversations, particularly about environmental issues and the need to come together uh, because of the crises uh, that we're facing in that regard and this remembrance of our connection to, to nature and some of the teachings in many of the old books on, on those aspects of, of, of nature uh, connectedness. Um, and that's the first time I had ever heard elders talk about that, where they had openly shared and, and been in participation with other religious groups around the world 
um, in, the, in this conversation in a very positive way, because we haven't had a good history sometimes with certain religions in our areas right. <laughs> um, because of the residential schools and all of these things. So, so that was particularly powerful for me to hear about those conversations happening and elders being open to connecting to uh, voices uh, around the world in that regard. But the other amazing thing I think that's starting to happen and we've seen this very acutely is the increasing rates of anxiety, uh, the increasing mm -hmm. rates of depression, the increasing uh, rates of uh, PTSD, whether or not it's climate anxiety or ecological grief or just loneliness, an epidemic of loneliness within our society, which is really a, a, a the root in our mind from a community perspective is disconnection, is, is disconnection at the root for that. And I think, it, at least this is my thought, is one of the reasons why we are seeing such an appetite now for Indigenous uh, traditional knowledges and ways of knowing because of the deep connectedness that exists there, that there's something powerful that, that people are seeking or, or you know, looking to because of this uh, disintegration that, that we start to see in our society um, happening on many different levels. Um, so there seems to be some bridge for, unfortunately, our levels of suffering as a society and, and really looking for, for things and, and maybe trying to find a, a deeper connection back to somewhere. Um, and, and, you know, Indigenous knowledge has been a piece of that. Mm. It is so interesting that we have created a society that aims towards prosperity, but is so undermining the well-being that theoretically prosperity would give rise to. Um, so there's a question here. Can we speak to Indigenous practices specifically about mental health? Any thoughts about our ability to connect better with our feelings, emotions, um, and our collective humanity? So mm. that following up on your connection and disconnection. Mm -hmm. Well, many, uh, the beauty of many uh, indigenous knowledge traditions as it pertains to our health and well-being is is really recognizing multiple dimensions of our being, whether or not it's the physical, whether or not it's the mental, the emotional, but also the spiritual component too. And, you know, in many of the uh, American um, based uh, tribes, you know, the medicine wheel is often a symbol that's very much used within teachings, but not all communities have medicine wheels, but will depict other types of representations. Uh, many will talk about about the seven directions, of course, uh, which mm. hold teachings around those medicine wheel. But what's interesting is that there's the up, the down, but then there's the within component too of the directionality of, of well-being. So understanding who we are uh, as people and our connections. And there was a, a Maori scholar by the name of Isaac Warbrook, and he made a brilliant statement. And I love to pass on this, uh, you know, in a way that connects to me, which is, asking people, you know, and reminding them that where we learn in school that 60% of our body is water. <laughs> it's a common fact that's known out there, but where does our water come from that we drink? You know, it comes from the tap. Well, before that, obviously from the water treatment plant, but before that, it often comes from the rivers. It comes from the lakes. It comes from the ground. It comes from these components of earth. So because of that, we are 60% that river. We are 60% that lake. We are 60% that ground. We are in and of itself a nature being from that. And sometimes it's just reconnecting people a little bit um, to, to remember them, rem remind them that they are part of something greater, that they, they have brilliance with inside of them. Imagine how long that water molecule has traveled throughout the eons of the planet from the rivers to maybe it was in an ocean at one point, maybe it was in a cloud. All of that is within your body. That experience of life is there and that's very powerful. So why I bring that up is within many Indigenous traditions, when it comes to mental health and wellness, the first thing that you'll get asked if you go to see an elder for support is not what's wrong, is not, you know, what's going bad in your life. It's about the good things that are happening. What are the strengths that you have, the gifts that you bring? It's an uplifting process. 
you know, and I'm reminded of uh, stories from the Rwandan genocide that happened when Western counselors were brought in. You've probably heard this story and, you know, we're bringing people into these rooms, counseling them, and, and they had to send the counselors away because they knew that the best way for their mental well-being was to get out, dance and sing with the community in the streets, be together as a collective. There was a power in that. So, you know, that component of, of uplifting and strengths of being, we focus so much on the negative that we forget about the positive components of our life and, and the gifts that we bring to the world. Um, and elders have an amazing way of bringing that out in people and just making you feel like you're so special and that you have those strengths to, to be able to get in, reminding you that that's the case and reconnecting you to those pieces of, of who you are and, and the story of what you're meant to be. Um, so. I think, you know, that's an important reflection. The last piece I'll say is that how many of you have went to a, a physician's office or, you know, a, a counselor's office and the provider ends the visit with, I love you. <laughs> mm. um, but it's not unheard of for an elder, an elder to finish a conversation with you to say that she loves you. Um, the grandmother to say that she loves you. It doesn't matter if she's your relative, blood relative or not, but you're seen as a relative through her. And it's meaningful. And, and it's said with such words that you feel love. And we forget about those simple things within the connections of mental and emotional well-being, of being okay to support others, even though they may not necessarily be our blood relatives within a Western way. So I just wanted to share those two because I think it brings up this conception and difference in how we approach our mental well-being and the things that we might do to, to bring about change within people and, and bring positive things to their life. Mm. So in your book, you tell this beautiful story about the distraught man who, young man who makes his way to the cabin of an elder. Would you tell that story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, you know, in my mind, just emblematic of the discussion we had where um, mental wellness is looked upon differently in communities. And for many people that have, you know, the Western diagnosis of psychoses or, or seeing things or hearing things out in the world, of course, might automatically get a diagnosis of schizophrenia or, you know, some type of mental illness disorder and usually prescribed quite powerful medications to be able to suppress those thoughts and needs, which you know, in some cases very well might be necessary. Um, but the this young man was on the verge of uh, thinking about uh, committing suicide and happened to see the light, um, the little firelight of an elder's um, cabin and, and went to go see. And, and actually, it, it's not an elder that lived in the community. It was one that was visiting there who happened to be there and ended up inviting the young man in and just listening to his story and, and letting him talk about the things he was seeing and the things he was hearing and the elder you know very much being in awe and telling this young man that you know the stories that you tell are about this great person in our community and our history you know this knowledge with inside of you you have a gift mm -hmm. uplifting this man that this is a gift within our society we look towards people that have these visions and can hear these things but oftentimes they're not guided in the right way to be able to manage those types of experiences experiences in a way that can benefit community. So it was just a great example how something that was very negative um, from a Western perspective um, and very traumatizing in a way and, and frankly stigmatizing was turned into something beautiful that this person now could look at, look at as a gift and figure out ways to be able to support themselves to ensure that they can manage it for the benefit of their community. Mm. And you also refer to something, I, I may get the phrase wrong, but love benches. Yeah, friendship benches, <laughs> friendship be benches. Yeah, they. And this was a case, uh, you know, a story. Um, it was a beautiful story from Zimbabwe, where uh, at first they got funding for mental health benches, and they called it a mental health bench. And the goal was to put elders or community, you know, aunties kind of things on a bench, and anybody could just go and have a conversation under a tree. But nobody came. <laughs> nobody could figure out what was going on from the funder's perspective. From the, you know. The, the Western perspective, but when they actually talked to the community, they realized, um, which is very common, that ben mental health just doesn't have a, a good translation. Sometimes it doesn't embody well in, in many communities and cultures around the world. So they changed it to a friendship bench. 
And lo and behold, everybody started showing up mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and wanting to talk to the community uh, a person who was there. Uh, you know, it's it's such a simple thing, but sometimes it's the recognition of the context that really makes the difference for, again, how we think through supporting people that, that may not have the same values or worldview that we do. Mm -hmm. The um, I'm going to go through some of the questions now. So the first one is about plant names. And uh, so we have names like they say Chad Bush and Juneberry. Um, and the question is, I wish I could know more about indigenous names of the growing beings. So is there a way that people who want to kind of understand in their communities what, mm -hmm. how things are indigenously named? Is that possible? Do you have thoughts about how to do that? Yeah, there's a number of resources actually that are available. In fact, I just saw one, uh, a news article that came out in this last week from the eastern part. This is in the eastern part of Canada, but my guess is that the eastern plants yeah. in Canada are probably a little bit similar to the at least the, the top so, uh, northern eastern coast of the United States. Um, and it was done by an Indigenous um, uh, community member or scholar, and they had put together a guide of Indigenous names of plants with some of the uses and, and so on. Um, I've also seen a number of reference books, uh, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, uh, but also uh, in uh, Canada as well, which has labeled the Indigenous names um, of, of all of the plants. So those resources do exist. Uh, the botanical books are out there. Um, some of the Western ones even will give the name names, uh, but sometimes they'll only give the names of one particular community because you might have 40, you know, tribes within one geographic area and everyone has a different name for that particular plant. <laughs> so it gets a little complex to, depending on uh, how widespread that plant is and, and kind of the local context that you have. Uh, but um, the only plants that might not have names or some of our, our very sacred plants that probably wouldn't be in the books with those names, but right. the common ones will be out there. There's resources right. now available. So another question about names is about Western names. So we are, you just came back from Climate Week in New York and uh, congratulations for surviving it. And, um, and there the phrase carbon neutral and net zero is used, you know, we use these very technical kind of numerical terms um, and they're not getting through to people. So, you know, from a really building, uh, I mean, they're, you know, they're not getting through to the to the masses. Um, so is there, you know, is there a, in it, this goal of creating this rebalanced or harmony um, you know, or of doing no harm, which is really what the idea of carbon neutral has, is there, from an indigenous point of view, is there another way to phrase this that you think might be more effective? Is there a way that you used when you were in New York? Mm. It's a, it's a, I actually got that exact same question in New York <laughs> for Climate Week in this discussion. So it's a common thread of, of conversations. And, and how I answered it in New York, and I'm going to answer it here the, the same way, is that these are, you know, such up and coming um, discussions that we have never had an opportunity as Indigenous peoples to gather our own community members into spaces to be able to talk through some of these things, to mm. talk through some of these issues. So I had proposed because my dream goal is I would love to 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 host an indigenous I don't want to call it a think tank, but I use that word because it's common within Western uh, ways of knowing and being, but a circle um, essentially of, of uh, folks that can come together to start to navigate some of these conversations. And we just have not had the opportunity um, to be able to bring people together to talk about these things. In addition to even the thing I mentioned before about how do we reconcile you know, the crises that we face with some of these traditional protocols that we're, we're not allowed to share. How do we think through these in a new level? landscape and a new world where crises is upon us for our children and our grandchildren. And we need the spaces to be able to talk these through. And I, I would right. love to have those conversations amongst Indigenous community member, members globally within an Indigenous-led space um, only so that we can kind of sort this stuff out and have a united front to start to say, hey, look, you know, these are the things that we think might work better <laughs> right. or, you know, so on. So um, I would love to at some point have this question again asked um, once that kind of conversation is is able to be um, 
hosted, so to speak, uh, with, with many different communities around the globe, having these important conversations. Mm. It's a very important, particularly due to the decimation of Indigenous peoples. So, for example, as you know, there's some knowledge that requires like two different clans to come together mm -hmm. to co-create it. And what do you do if one of those clans is no longer there? And, exactly. Um, there's a lot of complexity and, you know, it's hard to understand sometimes from an, from an outside perspective, how important these traditions are for people right. and for elders and, and how to be able to bridge those together. And, and we need the space and, and, and time um, to be able to, to, to have those conversations. And we, we haven't, had people motivated to to say hey we're going to give you this amount of money to bring people together but then you're not allowed to come <laughs> right. because it can, you know it has to be an indigenous safe space so it's a challenge with these types of things to to get funders on board and to to bring mm. people together in this way but i have a, i have a hope that um at some point these kinds of conversations they just need to happen we, we need to get people together that, that are working on these around the indigenous world because uh, there's a lot of brilliance out there that can be brought together i think for this purpose what a great great idea so if anybody on this call is a funder <laughs> or knows a funder please uh, get in touch with nicole um, another question is says as an indigenous person in medicine so that the, the, for the writer is an indigenous person in medicine who is interested in tribal driven research and forming academic and tribal community partnerships how do i ensure that the knowledge gathered is used um to uh, for the tribal communities themselves and not mm -hmm. just presented back but actually of service to them mm -hmm. Well, I think that what should be a common occurrence now is developing clear um, MOUs or memorandums, memorandums of understanding with tribal communities up front to really have these discussions before the work begins on who owns the data, how is the data going to be used, um, is there things that would be beneficial to communities and have agreements in place, because it really allows uh, 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 the expansion of um, an environment of greater trust because everybody understands the parameters that they're working in, what can't be shared, what can be shared, um, the types of processes that should happen within the community based on their protocols. Um, and I've seen some great examples of this uh, where research groups or institutions have created very clear MOUs with tribal communities or tribal governments or nations on these overarching parameters of understanding so that it makes a much more uh, uh, easier facilitation of thinking through um, some of the next steps afterwards. Uh, we need more of that. Uh, we just don't have it right now where researchers are asking those hard questions up front before the work starts. And I believe that that would really uh, help to facilitate greater dialogue because there's a trust element that's in place. Great. Um, another question. question um... Uh, somebody writes, and so uh, Monique, if you could capture this one as an invalid woman, invalid woman, rediscovering my connection to land and knowledge, I would love to volunteer to help with the think tank. So, uh, Monique, if you can capture her name, another uh, person says uh, that uh, Winona Winona Leduc calls what we're seeking the new green economy. That's an alternative phrase. Another question is, do you work, so in your health centers, do you work on an indigenous way of accompanying birth? And tell us something about that. I don't do babies right now, <laughs> but there's many beautiful indigenous midwife collective. And sorry, I just noticed there's a big loud noise happening outside. So I hope it's not okay. coming through. Um, there's a, a number of indigenous birth collectives um, and indigenous birth uh, midwifery um, clinics uh, and, and people that are just doing amazing, amazing work out there, indigenous doulas as well, both in Canada as well as the United States. And even just Googling indigenous doula, indigenous midwife now usually brings up a lot of these organizations that are doing this work. Um, I just saw a picture um, uh, of a, a mom who just gave birth. She was the first mom to give birth since before the uh, policies got instigated with the schools that brought birth home for her community. It was the first baby that was birthed there uh, since before all of these uh, harms had occurred. It was just amazing to see these stories start to come back. Great. And somebody wrote, I am a professional fundraiser and I'd like to volunteer my time. She's going to reach out to you. So 
this is really great too. There's somebody else um, who asked a question about they're planning a project and they actually would like to give some of the land within it back to the local tribe and asking about ideas about how to do that. So maybe Monique, you can capture that question. We'll pass it. It's got a lot of specific details that we can pass on back to you. Um, and uh, somebody else says that there's a book called the Haida Gwaii Re Lesson. Do you know it's spelled H-A-I-D-A-G-W-A-I-I -I Lesson? Do you know about it? The Haida Gwaii uh, community Ooh. is a First Nation community on the West Coast. Um, right. I'm not familiar with that resource, but they, they're that community and many communities are doing just wonderful work out on the West Coast. Right. So this is about how an Indigenous uh, community used in a modern law system to get stewardship of their land back. Um, another really interesting story about that is that, um, forgetting the name of the tribe now, but um, it was in the Minnesota area. And that, you know, every treaty they ever had was not obeyed and then replaced by a worse treaty and a worse treaty. But the one thing they had was the eternal right to collect wild rice from the waters. And the waters became so polluted and destroyed in the 70s and early 80s that there was no wild rice. And they sued under that provision and they won. And they won, the, and and the whole ecosystem of the area has had to be restored uh, for them to gain their right. And there is now wild rice again, and they are collecting it. But they used that little vestigial right to restore a whole ecosystem. And I can't remember how many billions of dollars have actually had to be put back into environmental cleanup and all that. And so, um, so anyway, those treaties do have some interesting resources uh, as, as abused as those treaties were. Um, uh, I'm gonna give you one more question and then our time is up. So can you speak a little more about the child level, hunter-gatherer level and elders level of knowledge? Yeah, the, this was actually um, passed on to me by my father who works in a um, small reservation community up in my home region. And they have a, a Dene Cultural Institute, which has been a repository for knowledge. And they had um, interviewed many elders as part of language revitalization projects to talk through a language. And, and this was one of the teachings that very much came out through that was elders recognizing those different levels of knowledge of community. And even from their perspective, you know, when a child starts to learn and you move to a communicative kind that we're not even in our, in our own indigenous language revitalization programs, we tend to focus a lot in schools on learning the numbers, learning the colors, learning these types of things, which is important for general communication. But sometimes we're not getting that deeper meaning of of some of those things that we had talked about earlier in the you know trapper hunter gather level language and then the elders language and those two levels you know in my mind are are the biggest concern of loss right now because when you learn a word and it's for communication purposes and and you sometimes may may not know the story that comes by it then then you lose a huge piece, piece of teaching in there mm. um and I think we need to reflect better, even as Indigenous community members, on how we think through transmitting those higher levels of knowledge in our teachings and not just focusing on some of the, the first and second level knowledges, which seems to be common in our language learning programs, uh, although there's differences between them. But again, speaking from my region. Mm. So I'm going to give you one last question where somebody says, before we conclude today, would you do me the favor of repeating the pronunciation of Dene Duikwe and so that we can hear, and maybe we can hear a fuller sampler, sample of your amazing native language. So Deninu Kwe, Deninu Kwe. Uh, Dininu is actually moose. So um, moose is a very common animal in our area up in the north. It's commonly uh, hunted and harvested. We use the hide uh, often to make our moccasins and, and many of our elements. The bones uh, of the, the moose is used, the scraping tools of the, the hides, and all parts of the animal are absolutely used, including the nose, the ears, the intestines, everything. Everything is used. There's no waste. And when we're 
done uh, with the moose when we've consumed it, we always bring the bones back to the earth as a part of a reciprocity as a thanks with that. Um, so it's not disposed of in the garbage or brought to the dump. It's always brought back to the land in that active, active uh, reciprocity. So I'll end with uh, Masi Cho, which is thank you, but uh, masi is, is kind of like a thank you, but how I've been taught is cho. So cho is like an honor. So it's added on to words. So de cho, if anybody's familiar with the great Mackenzie River that goes up uh, the Arctic way. So in the language, it's de cho because it's big river, but it's an honor river or tu cho would be an honor lake. So masi cho is an honor thank you. So a mm -hmm. thank you with honor. And thank you so much. Nicole, this has been really, really a wonderful conversation. We're so lucky to have you. Um, and Monique, if you can save the questions and get the, some of them are particular about how can I help or what can I do? If you would get those, I don't know if it's possible uh, to Nicole, that'd be great. Thank you so much for joining us today in this wonderful conversation. And thank you, our lovely audience for joining us. Just a reminder, all the forums are offered free of charge, but we love it when you support us. So please consider donating, some of you already have, to garrisonnews.org and click on the donate button. By the way, if any of you have tried to do that in the past, we've made it much more easy and efficient. So we'd love for you to make a contribution and become a sponsor. And please join us for our next Pathway to Planetary Health Forum on October 6th, so it's coming up soon, with guest Jamie Bristow, who we're going to discuss the inner resources for collective action in the climate chaos. Um, and there'll be more events on our calendar. Thank you so much for joining us today and goodbye and good health to everybody. <laughs>